Hear now the word of God from John chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him would not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. This is the word of God for the people of God. And so we say thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. About a week and a half ago, the children from St. Paul's gathered via Zoom on the computer to enjoy a smoothie-making party. This was part of our community's Lenten living observance, where we are focusing on the health of our bodies as well as the health of our minds and our souls, our spirits. The recipe for that week called for fruit and yogurt smoothies, and so the kids wanted to share the experience together. And it was such a fun time. It was the highlight of my week. We were able to talk about our favorite yogurts and the fruit that we preferred to use in smoothies, and we coordinated our activities so that we could all press the buttons on the blender at the same time, and we laughed about all of the noise that we were making. It was just beautiful. We enjoyed the simple pleasures that come from spending time with kids, even over the computer screen. And my very favorite part was the opportunity to pray with the kids. I asked them, do you have anything that you would like to share in prayer? Not one of them said anything for a moment. And then five-year-old Paisley said, no, nah, I'm good. And I said, okay, that's great. Well, let's pray. And as I began to pray, she said, wait, what is prayer? I said, well, that's an excellent question, Paisley. To pray is to talk to God. She said, oh, well, I want to talk to God. And I said, well, go ahead. You can say anything you like. She said, I love you, God. And I said, amen. I love you, God. Beloved, I don't know of a prayer that is more earnest and more complete than that one. These genuine words from a sweet kindergartner reminded me of how complicated we human beings are can make our faith sometimes, and even our prayers. It's in our nature, I suppose, as we grow older and begin to navigate so many different aspects of life that our faith would take on an intellectual quality. We tend to place a premium on what we think, and then that's how we talk about what we believe. What we think is what we believe. And then, at some point, our faith can become fairly transactional. So let's take our scripture for today, for instance. It is quite a famous passage that we find in the New Testament. It includes the first verse that I ever memorized as a child, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Yes, I said begotten, and whosoever, and believeth. We were a King James family at that time. And I can't see your faces right now, 
But I know that many of you just recited that verse in the version that you learned it, or at least you could have. Some sources say that this is the most quoted line in our entire Bible. Perhaps that's why people who do not even claim to be part of the Christian tradition know this verse. Perhaps they have heard it. Perhaps it has been shared with them as an invitation to accept Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, as the phrase often goes. I'll admit that I have shared that verse in this way. You probably won't be surprised to know that as a young person in the Bible Belt, I once carried my King James Version of my Bible in my backpack and took it to school. I remember fairly vividly one time when I took the Bible out and I turned to John 3.16 and I shared it with one of my friends whom I was just certain was ready to believe. And as you might guess, that exchange didn't go very well. My friend didn't come to Jesus, as we say. My friend didn't come to faith. In fact, I think our interaction pushed him further away from God. I know it pushed him further away from me for quite some time, and my mistake was an honest one. It was born out of concern for a person who was important to me. And I knew John 3.16 by heart, and I didn't want my friend to perish. I wanted my friend to have everlasting life, and I believed all he needed to do to get there was to believe himself. And that is where we often start with this verse, with what we believe. But God starts with love. Did you hear that? Did you hear it when we read the passage this morning? For God so loved. This famous verse begins with the action of God, not with our action. And we see this sequence over and over again in our current worship series, Promises Made, Promises Kept. Now these messages in Lent, they are designed to help us focus on God's actions as we acknowledge the limitations of our own humanity and we grow in our appreciation of God's faithfulness to us. So far we have acknowledged that God's grace brings renewal to our souls to the point that we can ground our identity in God's grace, and we can build a healthy community on that truth. Today, in our fourth week in our series, John 3.16 reminds us once again that God's acts of faithfulness precede our acts of faith. God's acts of faithfulness precede our acts of faith. For God so loved the world that God gave, God loved, God gave. God loved us. God loves us so much, beloved, that God gives us life. God gives us life. This news is as good today as it was in the time of Jesus and even in the time of Moses. Now, you didn't think that I was going to gloss over that reference to Moses and the bronze serpent that we read at the beginning of our passage for today. I know that you didn't because you know me better than that by now. We can find this story in the book of Numbers in our Old Testament. The people of God, the Hebrew people at this time, they find themselves in the wilderness having been delivered from slavery in Egypt after a series of miraculous events under the leadership of Moses. And they are grumbling. They're grumbling against Moses and against God. They're saying, why? Did you bring us here? Why did you deliver us from slavery only for us to die in the wilderness? They are tired. They are hungry. They are restless. And they cannot stop themselves from complaining. And to make matters worse, they find themselves surrounded by deadly serpents. Many people have been struck and died. And the people, the survivors, they attribute the experience to God as a punishment for their ungrateful attitudes. They beg Moses to convince God to take the snakes away. They beg Moses to convince God to take the snakes away. Moses prays to God and then makes a bronze sculpture of a serpent and puts it high on a pole 
where everyone can see it. The idea being that if someone is struck by a snake, that person can look at the bronze serpent and live. I'm not making this up. It's a wild story, and it is in many ways unsettling because it raises so many questions. First of all, why in the world would the people be so bold as to complain after being delivered from slavery? And also, did God really send those deadly snakes to stop the complaining? And wouldn't a bronze snake be considered to be a false god or at least an idol, both forbidden by God, as we learned last week? But most of all, if God was going to save the people once again, why not just take the snakes away? In other words, what is the deal with this bronze serpent and why is Jesus referencing it here in this passage about love and life? Well, these words of Jesus in the third chapter of John, they come in the context of a conversation with a great teacher of the law, a man named Nicodemus. And in the verses that precede our passage today, Nicodemus tells Jesus, God is with you. Nicodemus acknowledges that Jesus is a great teacher in his own right. And they begin to talk about what it means to have new life what it means to be born again as we often talk about our salvation. And Nicodemus is confused, and that's when Jesus tells this story about Moses and the people and the snakes, and he paints this mental picture of the bronze serpent lifted high, exalted, as a sign of God's faithfulness to the people even amid their grumbling, as a sign of the life that God gives even when people are quite literally surrounded by death. And in telling this story, Jesus is predicting not only his death, but his resurrection. Only this time, Jesus will be the one lifted high. First high on the cross, and then the empty tomb will be exalted as a sign of new life everlasting life that flows out of the love of God. So perhaps Jesus knows that people are always going to need a sign, especially when we are tired, when we are restless, when we are impatient, when we are grumbling against each other, even to the point of condemning each other, even when we don't mean to do so. Indeed, Jesus says in John 3, 17, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Of course, he doesn't stop there. Those who believe in him are not condemned, Jesus says in verse 18, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Then he goes on to talk about the alluring aspects of evil and of darkness, the deadly serpents of our day. Beloved, these words of judgment, for that is what Jesus calls them, have great power to harm when we wield them against each other in the name of what we believe, even when we mean well. I certainly meant well when I quoted John 3.16 to my friend. I was 11 years old. I had grown out of that sweet and earnest faith that so many children exhibit, so many children like Paisley who just wanted to tell God, I love you. I was a long way from the faith that I live today, a faith, admittedly, that is still growing and developing. And at that time in my life, in that time of adolescence, faith was for me much more a matter of the head than it was of the heart. And it can still be that way sometimes for me, beloved, and also for many of us, especially when we have experienced times of great sorrow and suffering and fear on the scale that we have been living for a year now. Maybe, maybe our hope is mounting now to the point that it can overtake our sorrow. And it's in this 
tender place of faith, beloved, that we must look up. We must look to the cross. We must put our hope in the empty tomb and remember that God so loves us that God gives us life. That's what we truly believe, isn't it? That's the story of the gospel, that good overturns evil, that light overcomes the darkness. All because the faithfulness of God precedes our acts of faith to give us new life. Thanks be to God for that. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for the gift of your Son, for the gift of your love, for the gift of life. We cling to the promises that you offer us, and we trust in your faithfulness to meet them. May our trust in you give us strength to share your love and grace in the world where it is so desperately needed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.